Uh, and um, a wonderful day to you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I think we have uh, two opponents today, the wonderful sun outside and the fact that we've just had lunch. Um, so we're going to do something against that uh, here in our session. We're going to talk about the future. Mind you, that is something uh, that you experience in many of the sessions uh, here at the ITF. But what we're going to talk about are the people who will shape and make the future of transportation. Those people that we all need to take us from A to B, wherever we've come from, uh, we will have met uh, some of the drivers, pilots, um, train drivers, specialists. Uh, we've been relying on the people doing the traffic management and uh, the people here up on stage on the panel will share their views with you. And I would like you to share your views with us uh, in the second part of the conversation so that we really have a debate going on, so that it's not just a panel talking uh, about you. So, that, with these words, uh, my name is Connie, uh, Connie Schumach. Um, I do a lot of congresses. Uh, I've had the pleasure of uh, doing a couple of ITFs as well. So um, I feel quite at home. I hope that you uh, feel at home too. Two big issues uh, we'll be having skills, people, uh, are there enough? Question mark. Uh, the probable answer will be no. But what is missing and where are we going to get the personnel from? Uh, that is uh, one aspect. And seeing that we're going probably to have too few people, we might as well look at one aspect, which is the gender balance. Um, right at the moment and uh, in preparation, I looked a little bit um, at the uh, sort of uh, facts and figures that they're out there. And even the guy who did the ILO study or the study for the ILO wasn't quite sure whether uh, his statistics were absolutely 100% correct. But uh, he found there were only two countries which had round about a third um, of women in their transportation industry, and that's Israel and Singapore. Uh, Israel, not astonishing uh, due to the fact that uh, women also have to do military service. Singapore, a small but powerful and forward-looking place. So that might be something to look at. Now, we, up here on stage, um, are, are um, amassed with a lot of women, as you can see, and that is not due to the second uh, part of the question. Um, so let me just uh, quickly introduce from my point of view to the right, from your point of view uh, to my left, uh, is Lisa Wright. She is the Minister of Transport uh, in Canada, and uh, I've asked uh, Lisa earlier uh, whether Canada has come here uh, to the ITF with a force um, and with a lot of power, and you can see uh, the lady at the helm of the delegation has a lot of power. On my left is uh, Susan Curland, Assistant Secretary for Aviation and International Affairs, uh, probably just from Washington, um, probably with another couple of talks uh, here in Leipzig and probably in Berlin. Um, I'll continue uh, on the right of uh, Lisa, on the left of Lisa from your point of view, uh, is Cindy Miller, CEO of Europe of UPS. And I'm quite sure that uh, most of you will have received their parcels either through UPS or from some not to be talked about competitors. Um, so <laughs> she'll be talking about the industry. I'll continue uh, on that side and uh, uh, we find uh, Eduardo Chargas, the General Secretary of the European Transport Workers Federation, um, who will be of course uh, talking about that side of affairs. Uh, I'll turn to my left um, and uh, uh, we'll find Jean-Pierre Lubineau, uh, the Director General of the UIC, the International Union of Railways, um, a very particular area and one that is worthwhile looking at. And um, the one with probably a sort of a tiny halo uh, above his head is Daniel Azema, but he can't help that uh, because it's just the stats and figures. Uh, he's the director of the cabinet of the Secretary General of the International Civil Aviation Organization. And why am I saying halo? Because um, the aviation industry has the highest percentage of women employed in that industry, why that is and what you need in the future uh, will be a topic to be talked about. Now, Lisa, um, I already shared with you that I had one uh, member of uh, your delegation with uh, us yesterday and um, he said we were talking about big data, we were talking about traffic management and about 
which is sort of you know part and parcel of the future. Um, and he said, yes, if only we had the right people, or if only we had enough of the right people with the right skills. Uh, is is skill management uh, something that is tied with transportation management these days? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> so I'm glad, uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction. It's good to see everybody today. I have a lot of stats and figures because you know I'm going to jump in on the gender question too because that's obvious. I just want to point out that we have a delegation of six and um, five of them are women. So we're, we're exceeding the, uh, the normal number. I, and it's just a fluke. I actually just did the, the calculation in my head. So you, uh, you're, the guest panelist was our token male on the, uh, on the trip that you just had. That's a joke, <laughs> people. You're supposed to laugh at that. The, um, so yeah, we, we're certainly in Canada, we're very focused on, uh, on making sure that people have the right skills. Um, Canada, as you know, is a small population and we continue to increase the number of jobs that are available and we're having the gap. We have a skills shortage and we have a skills gap. So what we've done uh, from our government's point of view is really try to educate kids and moms and dads uh, about the availability of the jobs of the future and match them to the jobs of the future instead of having a situation where we continue to graduate so many people in a certain sector of which we have a dwindling number of jobs and a good example of that would be um, teachers in Canada. As our population decreases of course we don't need as many teachers and smaller communities are having that situation happen to them in their school boards but yet we still continue to have many teachers graduating every year so what we're trying to do is consciously talk to employers and talk to parents to ensure that we have the right mix of skills um, because kids can choose whatever they want to do in, in terms of uh, attaining higher education. Canada leads the OECD in the number of uh, students that graduate or enrolled in uh, post-secondary education or tertiary education as it's called, um, which is a great statistic to have but not necessarily in the right skills which we're creating jobs in. We do create a lot of jobs in the resource industry but they are high skilled, high tech jobs, either in science, technology, engineering, or mathematics. And those are the areas that we really do have to focus on. When we determined that we were having a difficulty with, uh, with skills, um, we decided to take a, a pretty bold policy approach. And we looked at industry, and we determined that industry wasn't doing as much training as they should be doing. I know that you don't have that issue here in Germany. We definitely have that issue in, in Canada. They were not investing in training. So what we set up is a program, and it's called a job grant, and we make available an amount of money to an employer that they have to match as well, too, that enables them to bring in a, an apprentice or a student in order to train them up. Uh, the main concern of employers in Canada with respect to this, of course, is I spend all this money in training and then, unfortunately, they'll be trained up for somebody else because it's a competitive market once you have training and skills. But, as we say to the employers, you still have to train people because we're not going to be having um, a system of education where we're specifically training for the job that you have open. So, we've, uh, we've seen some employers step up to to the, the challenge in terms of moving forward on the job grant. And we think it's a good program. We think it's the right way to go. But right now, um, we spend a lot of time thinking about the skills and the jobs of tomorrow and trying to ensure that we have that pool of candidates. There are two specific pools of candidates in Canada that are untapped, in my opinion, and in a lot of people's opinion. One of them is our First Nations, our Aboriginal people. It is the youngest demographic that we have, and also it's the most important one we have because we really do need to have to make sure that we offer skills and training to everyone in Canada so that they can have um, a career and they can have a job. And the other pool of untapped talent in the technical fields, of course, would be women. And I know that we'll discuss that later. So those are the kinds of things that we're focused on. When I, I was Minister of Labor for three years prior to my time here in transport, and uh, the one thing that we continuously worked with, with employers, with em unions, with, with everyone, is making sure your workplace, of course, is safe and it's innovative, but it's diverse. And you really want to have that diversity as well, too. In transport, it's very difficult most of the time when I walk into a room to discuss what's going on in policy, it is a room full of men. It's not a room full of people who look like me, and certainly not a room full of, of, uh, of uh, a diverse 
cut of what Canada looks like. And we really have to do better and work better to ensure that we get that diversity because we do believe that with diversity in the workplace, you end up actually getting more innovation and more productivity. So that's what we're trying to achieve. We want our workplace to represent and look what Canada looks like, which is a multicultural mosaic of all kinds of different people from different countries. And together, that will help us have a very competitive and a, and a very productive transportation workplace and a transportation force. So those would be my initial comments. Thank you very much uh, for sharing. And I'll hand over the microphone uh, to Susan Quillen. Um, from a European point of view, the US and Canada always sort of seem to be um, aligned, good cousins, um, maybe not sisters and brothers, but good cousins. So um, would you actually, um, in the area of transportation, find similar challenges? I mean, with a, an incredibly growing transportation demand um, uh, that is going to hit you in the next 10, 20 years uh, in the US, despite the fact that we have IT-based communication uh, possibilities, people will still want to move from A to B um, and back. Um, so where do you see the gaps? Um, and I assume, um, sorry, seeing that you're also a woman, that you have um, uh, an open eye uh, for the gender question as well. Uh, absolutely. I have an, uh, I'll, I'll be interested in talking about the, the gender question as well. I mean, I'm delighted to be here today, and I'm very pleased that looking at the diverse group that we have on this panel, not only you know folks from the the federal governments, but from uh, from the private sector and from labor, because we you know we we all are part of the the, the question and the answer. So it, it's very important that we're all, that we're all part of this discussion. So in the United States, very similar to some of the things that Minister Rate was saying, our our country depends on a very skilled and qualified transportation workforce. And what we are seeing and what we will be experiencing that of the 11 million jobs that transportation accounts for, it wouldn't be, wouldn't be anything if I didn't give you a few facts, um, and the transportation-related employment in the U.S. accounts for about 8.7% of civilian workers. But what we are seeing is that in, studies are indicating that 50% of the transportation workforce in the U.S. will be eligible to retire in the next 10 years and that's double the uh, retirement rate of the nation's entire workforce. So we are paying a great deal of attention uh, to that. And so what I'd like to do um, with you is share some of the important initiatives that we are planning and some that we have in place. Uh, President Obama, we, under President Obama, we just uh, introduced, uh, put forward the Grow America Act. And as part of that, we want to create jobs and to take some significant steps in order to strengthen our, our transportation workforce by helping to prepare the next generation of transportation workers. Because making sure that we have folks who have the right skills and the right qualities for these jobs will be key. So under this proposed bill, we've included $245 million in workforce development grants, and those would be spent over a period of four years. And we've identified uh, three areas uh, that we want to focus on to enhance size, diversity, and skills. And that would be to strengthen the collaboration between transportation agencies, employers, and workforce programs to make sure that we're doing things effectively. Two, we wanted to promote the use of registered apprenticeship and job training programs. And three, we are working to create an incentive grant program for the states so that we can effectively use on-the-job training funds and also to require the states to develop transportation workforce plans that identify both immediate and future um, needs um, that we'll be seeing in employment. So, Presently, under, the, under our U.S. system of funding transportation improvements, we provide over $51 billion a year in surface transportation construction funding. And so communities across the country have long sought the ability to leverage those funds into local jobs and economic growth. And it's important to remember that every billion dollars in public infrastructure spending creates 13,000 jobs. So really, you know, infrastructure creation and development is really an economic generator and a job creator. And some of the things that we're already doing at the Department of Transportation in the area of aviation, we've got the Aviation Space 
Education Program, which is administered by our FAA, and it's a career exploration program which offers curricula and educational activities for students from K through 12. And so what we do, we facilitate partnerships through the FAA, local schools, and the aviation industry. Our FAA uh, air traffic control training program hires and trains future air traffic controllers, and those are good jobs. Our maritime administration operates the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy, uh, as well as we provide funding to maritime academies across the United States. And we also work um, to remove barriers, what we'll talk about later, removing barriers to women's transportation. So um, with that, I will turn the microphone back to you. That's wonderful, or we'll uh, put it down here. <laughs> um, and I'll uh, turn uh, over to Mr. Uh, Chagas. Um, uh, Eduardo, um, what specific interests or what specific um, challenges do you see sort of from the transportation worker side? Um, like, let's um, not talk about gender right at the moment, but um, if you talked about uh, jobs that young kids aspire to, young kids aspire to. Um, certainly here on this continent, um, it was still for a long time, okay, um, in our ages, uh, you know, I become a train driver. Um, and there were sort of, you know, some, some books about that. Uh, okay, not enough did. But um, how does that transpose to the reality that you find now and of course, girls wanted to become hairdressers, um, unfortunately, and we've talked about that earlier. Um, but as I said, I didn't want to want, you know, is, is there still an aspiration um, of young kids to go into transportation? Or, I'm sorry, today, IT sounds so much more sexy. Yes, th thank you very much for the invitation. And I would like to, to start by thanking the I this ITF for having inviting us the ETF and the other ITF, which is 110 years older, um, for the first time for uh, addressing uh, one of your conferences, um, which uh, I believe, uh, especially on this topic, is, uh, should be an ongoing topic in your agenda for future meetings. Um, indeed, uh, well, I was a seafarer for some, some years uh, last century, uh, and those days, um, People were queuing to, to uh, join the nautical school in my country and in many, many other places. Um, those were days of economic exp expansion, of, um, in a way, protected markets, and uh, quite a significant uh, level of, of uh, qualified jobs and decent jobs. Um, with uh, the so-called elimination of barriers, um, with uh, the opening of markets, um, we have unfortunately um, assisted to um, uh, uh, raise to the bottom in terms of costs and labor costs are the ones easier to try to cut um, and this has uh, kept people away from, from the professions. Um, we are currently um, uh, witnessing an extreme uh, 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 um, violent um, race to the bottom in many uh, transport modes. Already in 96, I have attended a conference in, in Dublin, uh, which was called uh, is the, um, the Maritime Profession and Endangered Species. Um, I've seen from the ICAO report, we are, you are um, worried about the future of having enough pilots to, for, for the, the aircraft. Um, this is um, almost common to all transport modes, and why? We have precisely um, been uh, competing on the base of uh, labor costs, not on the, on the basis of uh, fair competition. Uh, labor costs uh, and social dumping do not affect only um, the workers and their working uh, life on board the, 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 the vessels, the planes, the, the, the trains, the trucks, but also affects the, competi the, the competitive level of bona fide companies which pretend to, to play according to the rules in the market. Is that a general phenomenon that you observe or is that specific to the transport sector? No, you, you have maybe the majority of the companies attending this conference play according to the rules and um, those, that's where we are looking for allies in order to keep, keep out of uh, business those companies which insist in breaking the rules, in playing with uh, 
um, low cost uh, and uh, low conditions uh, on their workforce. Mm. Um, because I think this is in the interest of both sides uh, in the industry. Um, I'm very happy to be sitting next to a UPS representative. A few years ago, we were struggling for, we were struggling, sorry, for the interpreters, uh, for uh, a contract with UPS Turkey, which was a major achievement when we managed. And uh, we have uh, recently done um, a working contract for DHL Turkey. And this is the way, we, way to, to progress. We see the figures in the uh, end of the year for big multinationals. They have the margin to provide good conditions for their workers, to keep the business running well, and to keep their uh, stakeholders also happy. Thank you so much uh, for your initial remarks. Um, uh, Cindy Miller has already uh, been addressed uh, um, uh, as, as a good representative. Um, uh, Cindy, um, on the flip side of the IT revolution and uh, of every one of us uh, being able to order online, um, there must be those people who actually deliver the goods. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, an increase in business, I would assume, um, on uh, your business side, both involving logistics and transportation. Um, how have things changed in the last couple of years and do you actually find enough skilled um, potential employees or do you struggle to get them? <clears throat> well, thank you very much. Uh, like everyone else, I'm very pleased to be here today. Um, just talking about this very important topic and representing UPS. Um, at just a, a very quick background, UPS is, uh, we employ 400,000 people around the world. So I think in the United States, last I checked, we were about the fifth largest employer. And then globally, I know we're in the top, I think we're in the top 20. <clears throat> so as a result, when you're, you're a business that doesn't make anything, you don't have a secret sauce locked in a vault, you don't have... Um, you know, the next la latest, greatest gadget that's coming out that begins with the letter I. Um, so as a result, uh, you're only as good as your people are. And we like to say that our secret sauce is our people. Um, here in Europe, we've got about 45,000 uh, UPSers. And one of the things that we realize is um, th there is there is growth, there is opportunity. Uh, we continue to see a tremendous amount of opportunity um, around the world. And for us, um, we, we like to say that um, one of the things that, that we see for keeping the workforce, because there, there are many problems out there, finding good workers is one of them, but then also retaining the ones that you have that are already well-trained. Uh, and to um, my colleague's perspective, you know, getting a good, good career or a good opportunity as opposed to um, you know, not, not being in a, in a good environment. Um, what, one of the things that we do is we've got a culture of promotion from within. Um, I won't get into this at this moment, maybe a little bit later, but um, I'm a classic case of that. I started as a package car driver, which in the U.S. Um, we call our vehicles package cars, yet it's a truck. Um, and I began as a truck driver uh, in the state of Pennsylvania in the U.S. To over 25 years ago. And from there, as you can see, opportunity from within, I've, I've had uh, tremendous opportunity but has have, as have many at UPS. Here in Germany, uh, 80, I believe it's just over 80% of our people in management started with a frontline position. They were either an administrative person, they washed trucks at night, they, they drove or they did whatever. And I believe that's part of the secret that we've had for over 107 years at UPS. And I, don't, and I see that even becoming that much more of a unique um, piece of our culture that, that seems to work well uh, with our employees. So th that's one thing, I think. But, but the other thing to, um, uh, to, um, to Lisa's point about training, several people have brought up training. And I can't even begin to tell you enough about how important all of that is from a retention and then also just from a, an attraction perspective to future employees. Uh, UPS spends roughly $500 million a year in, in uh, training. So that 500 million, and of that, about 25% of that goes specifically towards safety training. Uh, the rest of it is other types of skills and, and uh, job capabilities and advancements and technology. So we're, I, I think um, the key that really has to be pushed, and I think the merit of many employers, um, one of the questions I tell um, you know, my own 
kids in my family or my children or, or nieces and nephews is, you know, in an interview question, um, it, it's always an interesting question to ask your employer, you know, exactly, you know, how much do you as a business invest in training? Um, employers, they always tell me, are never used to the question. Uh, they always get a surprised look, but I think it tells a lot about, um, about who businesses are and, and what they believe in based on that type of statistic. So I think um, diversity is very important. Um, and, and the other thing, though, as far as attracting new talent, I, I love what, what they do here in Germany with reference to the apprenticeship concept. Mm -hmm. uh, we've taken that, and uh, we have something similar in the U.S. We're adapting a good bit of that. We're trying to roll some of that out right now in the U.K., uh, and I believe that, that these types of things are key because, uh, to be quite honest, transport is not sexy. Um, and it, it's very, very difficult, I think, uh, to compete with gadgets and to compete with technology. And uh, yet, I think in order, um, I, I think even the education system needs to do a little bit better job of educating folks that, that when a company like UPS, who carries, we carry 6% of the GDP, uh, in the U.S., 2% of the global GDP. Uh, so if you were going to get something somewhere, more than likely we've had something to do with it. Uh, we, and, and I think that, that we need to, to really blend and, and share that message with folks at an earlier age that there are some amazing careers um, you know, in, in other industries other than those that we, uh, that we play with. Cindy, um, when we had a quick chat beforehand, you shared two figures with me that I thought were quite impressive, and therefore I'd like you to repeat them. Okay. Uh, you were talking about the percentage of women on the whole in UPS, and then on the percentage of women in management. Okay. Um, at, at UPS, of those 400,000 employees, about 16 to 18 percent of our total workforce is in non-management positions. That would be everything from manual laborers, drivers, sorters, administrative people, clerical people, etc. However, when you take a look at us from a management perspective, 40% um, of our management representation is, is uh, female. And what we see is when we can get folks in the door, and I don't think the goal is to, to force people into the industry, but I think the key is when you get folks in there to figure out how to make the place attractive where people can see that there's career opportunities for them to advance. Uh, I'm a classic case of that, as are you know, many, many others at UPS. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to turn uh, to the left. And uh, when I talked about uh, the boy's dream of uh, actually sort of uh, be a train driver, um, uh, you must have uh, been grinning, uh, Jean-Pierre. Um, did you ever dream about that? OK, <laughs> um, I failed there on this assumption. Uh, but where are your uh, big tummy aches? Uh, because I, I should think um, whereas aviation was always uh, very skill-based, um, at least uh, from the concept, um, train driving seemed to have been just like, you know, you have one set of skills, and then you do it. Um, these days, train transport has changed completely. How do you adapt um, with? personnel, what kind of people are you looking for, and how will you get them? It's a big question. Um, <laughs> and it's not only about train driving, there is a lot of jobs in there. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, and let me tell you in a few words, actually, uh, about UIC and what it is. UIC is a world organization gathering all actors around the world uh, among the rail operating community. So we gather 240 members in 95 countries, and it all represents actually 1 million kilometers of infrastructure uh, and many locomotives, uh, but also 7 million people. 7 million people at the service of the mobility by rail of 7 billion people. So it's a ratio of 1 to 1,000, which in effect, compared to your 11 million in the US, for the transportation is not, uh, is not much. And you are right, I'm not sure it's... Tommy ache, but it's a problem. And uh, it may be a bird's eye view because I'm talking about the situation around the world, but I think every country is facing now more or less the same problem, which I would call the generation gap. You know, uh, and you used the words first. Uh, uh, in the second part of the, uh, the 20th century, uh, going to the rail industry was not really sexy. You go to IT, finance, uh, aviation, but not to rail. And uh, in the 21st uh, century, we see that rail is developing for a number of reasons, which is not the, the topic of this panel. And therefore, we need to attract more people, the younger generation, to, uh, to manage 
the rail development. And rail is a very complex industry with a lot of technology. It's not only uh, train driving, but behind that there is a lot of things on distribution, on research, mm -hmm. on, uh, on management, on stations, on interfacing. It's, it's very, very complex with a lot of uh, jobs and very, very diversified. So therefore, we have actually a big, big challenge, which is the transmission of knowledge when it is still possible from the older generation, because rail is all about like many uh, uh, jobs, but uh, uh, maybe more than some others uh, in transportation, is safety, capacity, sustainability, energy, distribution. So all of this needs a transmission of knowledge from those who still know about it and have managed it very properly, and also attract uh, through education development of competence, new generation from the academy, from the young students, to be trained, actually. And uh, this is at three levels, the level of uh, professional training, the level of management, because it's actually uh, 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 businesses with a lot of management and managerial skills needed, uh, and uh, also uh, from the academic. Uh, because uh, research is foremost, because new technology is there to be developed and make it more efficient and productive. So we need actually to organize this transmission and development of competence at these three levels. We do this in UIC somehow with regional training centers, uh, with also uh, uh, global uh, conferences, workshops, and we just uh, launch an, for the first time a rail MBA uh, for those from the university who would like to have this MBA title, but uh, focused and specialized in rail management and business. How many people have you already trained uh, with the MBA? Are, already, uh, are they already MBA holders yes, out yes, there? Yes, 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 absolutely certified uh, as an MBA by the uh, Shanghai list. And they did get jobs straight away? Uh, we are launching it, but okay. I think it will help. <laughs> I think it will help. Okay, um, I'd like to bring uh, Daniel uh, into the conversation um, and I've um, sort of, you know, given you um, a bit of space already uh, saying that, um, you know, the amount of uh, women that you employ is a bit higher than in the other industry, in the other parts of the transportation industry. Um, but um, being so technically oriented, um, you must be competing with a lot of other, in, in what commas, sexy jobs. And these days, aviation isn't half as attractive as it was, let's say, 50 years ago, because everybody knows that also there you actually have to work. Um, so how do you compete? How do you sort of uh, say, yes, it's still attractive to become a pilot? If you don't mind, I will switch uh, to French language. <laughs> It's easier for me, but if there is a problem, I can continue in English, but... Effectivement, comme... Well, you said it yourself. Aviation is no longer that sexy as it was some decades ago. And there are different reasons that not everybody knows. Well, first of all, you should start from the very beginning. I don't think that it is a gender problem. I think it is rather a general problem. With many jobs in the av aviation industry, there are clear regulations. We have a system with international standards, with licenses. This applies to pilots, but this also applies to older professions like onboard mechanics and other jobs that are less well known. For instance, the air traffic controllers, the aviation technicians that are in charge of maintenance, but also those who are in charge of operating airports. And many important jobs are limited through licenses. And there are major demands regarding those licenses when it comes to training, etc. And it is very comprehensive and complex. Having said that, costs of education play a big role. But there is also a difficulty when it comes to training. This is maybe also one reason that explains why those jobs are not so attractive. Plus, the governments in the different countries gave up the trainings that they had been in charge of. In many countries, we had 
vocational training centers that were run by the government. And we have fewer and fewer of those. For pilots, for instance, many things have been privatized. And of course, this involved and involves huge costs. So this is a fast problem. Another problem, which also has major implications, is the following. We have conducted studies, first one in 2001, it's not that long ago, on the perspectives and on the demand for jobs in the aviation industry. And, well, of course, there are some hypotheses regarding those topics that we have put up and it turned out that not everything was right. But in this, in the context of the study, we talked about training, we talked about demands, and we saw that there was a big gap. Let me give you some figures regarding the pilots, for instance. The demand, the annual demand for pilots is 13,000 in Asia per year, 12,000 or more than 12,000 in Europe, 3,700 in Africa, 5,900 in the Americas, and 2,400 in the Middle East. Only in Northern America do we have training capacities that are bigger than the demand. But globally, there is a deficit. I could give you other numbers and figures, but this just underlines what everybody has just said. The results of the study led to a situation and I think that this is close to what the representative of the United States just said, showed that we need a new training, a new training system for the new generation to make sure that all people interested get a new chance. We need a new thrust. We need new momentum for this industry and for the training. In autumn 2014, we will have or we will see new efforts to provide new momentum to this training system. We will have a support by the International Committee for Aviation, the ICAO. We hope that we will be able to solve this problem, but it's not clear yet. And one last point that I would like to share with you, if you bear with me for another minute. When it comes to aviation, we have seen many new technologies. This, of course, applies to other jobs as well. And the role of human beings has changed. We have also seen this in recent accidents. We have seen that there have been problems in the pilot training and that this resulted in different accidents. For instance, the Air France accident in Rio. One reason was that the training was not sufficient. Pilots are not sufficiently trained in order to respond to those emergency situations. So if technologies and devices fail, pilots are no longer able to solve the problems. As a consequence, we have to include certain elements in the training so that they can master those challenges. But this human being computer interface is a problem. And we hope that human beings will be indispensable also in the future and not totally replaced by technology. Thank you. Before I uh, get the audience in, uh, the first round, I would actually like to sort of shape around um, what kind of skills are you looking for? Um, uh, Lisa, you uh, have, and Susan also have been talking about the programs that you've set up, but um, what kind of skill sets um, are you looking for? Um, never mind whether it's a German system, which seems to have worked in the past quite well, um, but what kind of people do you need? What kind of skills do you need in order to fulfill the, uh, the transport needs um, and, and on both sides? And um, um, uh, Eduardo, um, are the skills there or are the skills not there because people are not paid enough uh, in the transportation area? And um, I, I would like you to answer sort of quickly, how do you actually get around that, um, the issue? Uh, maybe Lisa, you would uh, take the lead and, sorry, the microphone has to That's walk okay. around. 
So focusing specifically on transportation, mm -hmm. um, as I've mentioned uh, in the past, Canada is a trading nation, mm -hmm. and we do um, a significant amount of export and, and to an extent, an amount of import. A lot of it's coming in through our ocean ports. Mm -hmm. So we do need to have uh, people who are general laborers, uh, and we need people at, uh, at all levels. But I'll just give you a statistic um, that I found interesting with respect to trucking. Mm -hmm. um, so when a container lands in Vancouver or in Montreal, yeah. it needs to get to its destination. Sometimes right. it's the United States, sometimes it's somewhere else in Canada, but there's a distance to go. So mm -hmm. you do by rail or you go by truck. In Canada on long haul trucking by 2020, which is only six years away, the gap between the supply and demand of drivers is about 25,000 which is a huge number when you mm -hmm. consider what our population is. Mm -hmm. It's not an attractive, um, it's not an attractive uh, vocation, not because it's not lucrative. It can be lucrative. It can be something people make money from, but they don't want to be away from their homes. They mm -hmm. think about work-life balance. It's not something that fits into what they view as themselves in terms of, in terms of issues. So one of the things that we've turned to in Canada for these, um, I, I wouldn't call them low skill, I'd call them unskilled jobs. Mm -hmm. Being a truck driver does entail having skills and a specific license, but it does um, it does come into that area. We have approached it in Canada by offering um, temporary foreign worker permits for okay. people to come in, not to immigrate, but but to work for a period of time in Canada. It has challenges, um, so we're trying to feel our way through. But from the skill set in transportation, where we see the gap right now is in those uh, those areas in which a person comes in literally off the street and is trained in whatever uh, is going to be the need of the workplace, either in longshore or in terms of uh, driving or, uh, or general laboring. Um, can I just sort of um, ask one more question sort of relating to your wonderful example? Um, uh, there seems to be a sort of dichotomy. There are many people need it, especially on that level. However, if you look to the future, and what we heard yesterday uh, about sort of automated driving, etc. Um, there will come a time when we don't need drivers, or if so, then we need um, uh, drivers that, that are also RFID specialists that are um, uh, capable of then sort of maybe even doing the final delivery, etc. So, um, it, is it also a question of um, the way that people, young people, maybe view? Uh, the industry, why they might not be going into that, and what hub could one turn? So the concept of automated driving, either in trains or in uh, trucks, is not something that's in the mindset of a Canadian. Okay. They don't see that coming as the future. Right. This really is a case where, although the average salary can be quite good, it's the time away from home and it's the, the self-visualization of not being in that business. No one aspires like you said, yeah. to be to be a truck driver, although it's a it's a great um, it, it can be a great career for people. Uh, and but constantly you will see signs all over the place in Canada hiring drivers, hiring drivers, and it is a difficulty for us because we need to move those containers um, inland. Thank you so much. Um, um, what are your biggest sorry? <laughs> uh, what are your biggest tummy aches? Um, uh, is it uh, rather the sort of uh, lower skilled, um, um, practical um, application worker? Or is it really sort of, you know, the, the people behind the IT systems managing? Uh, well, I think, traffic. you know, it, it's, it's a great question, but I think it, it's probably all of them. Mm -hmm. You know, we're seeing in these mass retirements happening. We have existing jobs that need to be filled, but we also have to prepare for the future. So, you know, one of the things that we've been trying to do is to work more with universities. We've got uh, our Universities of Excellence program where we partner with universities and various research programs uh, to think about the future. We're partnering with um, or providing funding for uh, community college programs to provide uh, training, for example, for aircraft mechanics. Um, so we are taking a look at all of these um, types of issues. And, and one other point I would like to make is, you know, we've been focusing more on either the IT worker or the general uh, labor, but transportation encompasses so much more. I mean, if we look probably just at the folks on this panel, we all come from very, you know, different backgrounds, yeah. whether it's legal, accounting, HR, 
uh, or policy. So I think we want we need to be very broad in our approach towards getting folks into aviation, <laughs> which is aviation, into transportation. Yeah. But one of the points I think that was raised earlier is we got to we have to do it early. You know, at the grammar school age, you know, do we make it part of, you know, examples at the children's museums or what? But we just have to get, get to folks early and, and have them think about it as, um, you know, kids always wanted to be a fireman. Why wouldn't they want to be a conductor or an airline pilot? Mm -hmm. So. Um, Eduardo, um, on, on, on the issue that we've just dis discussed, is it a question of financial incentives, uh, and you've been talking about the spiral to the bottom, um, or is it also much more a question of attractiveness? Uh, because um, a young person today that has a good schooling, I'm not even talking about the, the, the most brilliant ones, a person with a good schooling has so many choices, uh, so many job opportunities, and there are some that are just by nature seem to be more attractive. I'm not talking about media necessarily because we, we shouldn't push the idea, uh, but we probably have, if you made a questionnaire, we'd have many more people wanting to go in the media than we ever need. Uh, we can't communicate that much, uh, but we still need to sort of um, uh, carry goods and uh, services around and people around. Um, so so what, from your point of view, what needs to be done? Definitely the issue of working conditions is, is in the core uh, of the solution. You can have all kinds of incentives if people know that they are going to be put on, on, on a vehicle where they have to sleep in the truck or they will be months away, uh, badly paid, uh, away from the families, they will not go. Mm -hmm. So you have to address that side. But we, we have also tried to address, let's suppose that the working conditions are good. Uh, once the, the European Commission launched a campaign to attract people for seafaring professions, I went back to my union in Portugal, which is a seafaring union, uh, and they told me, are you crazy? I wouldn't advise my kids to go on board a vessel these days. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, but supposedly the conditions are good, uh, and we have done quite a significant job with uh, employers' organizations, practically in all sectors in Europe. We are social partners in several uh, social dialogue committees. And we have the opportunity to meet with the employees and try to, to find common solutions for common problems. Not always easy, um, but for instance, in, the, in shipping, we have uh, um, done a project uh, on a career, uh, career path mapping for seafarers because people need to have proper information. When, mm -hmm. Once you go on board a vessel, mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you will end up with a long white beard and a, <laughs> a pipe on your mouth. There are plenty of opportunity, opportunity careers on board, but also ashore, with, uh, in ship-related activities. And this applies to other sectors too. So it is important that this, this um, uh, promotion is, is made so that people know that uh, there is a, a, a another, another way of, uh, of uh, progressing in, with their careers. But it's also important that um, um, Already today, good companies already attract, already attract more than uh, jobs that they can offer. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is the case in all sectors too. Well, because people talk to each other. I've been told, uh, I'm not sure if it was said by a, a Greek ship owner, that um, on board one of their vessels, uh, two cadets came for the first time and abandoned the ship immediately when they understood they wouldn't be able to use Facebook. <laughs> so this, um, yeah. because the, the, the ship would be trading uh, far away, you know, not in between the islands, and that's where they would like to be working because they, they need to be in contact with their friends. And of course, yeah. nowadays, young people have other expectations also. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that the, uh, studies are being made also how to, to provide these facilities on board, which is not that uh, cheap. Um, but uh, if it is included in the package that is offered to, to the, the new recruits, can attract more people. Cindy, um, running a company um, is, of course, different from uh, running a government, uh, a ministry, or sort of setting uh, the right policies. Um, yet one can always learn from each other. Um, listening to um, the two ladies uh, from Canada and the US, what could you share what worked 
um, with UPS um, that could be picked up in some of the programs, of course not all, but in some of the programs that could give an idea, uh, you know, this is a hub that we can, can turn, uh, this is a screw that can, uh, can be pushed in a bit further. Um, so what would you say is, is the road to success um, where you've actually scored points? Well, I, I, I'll, I'll get to that in one second, but I think I have a better example of maybe how something hasn't, hasn't necessarily worked. Now, and I'll just, just give you an example here. If we want to talk about, everybody's concerned about safety. Safety on the roads, everybody needs to be safe. And, and, and at UPS we get that. We have over 7,500 drivers that have driven for 25 years in a row without an accident. They've driven enough miles that you could drive from here to Mars and get back. So, so there are companies out there and where, where safety is, is part, of, part of one's culture. And in Europe, years ago, in 1999, prior to 1999, you could get a, like for me, I, I graduated from, um, or I, I left school and had various uh, jobs, but I could drive my car, and then I could turn around and I could drive a, a, a brown, the usual brown, ubiquitous brown vehicles that you see either here in Europe or, or over in the US. And I could, I could get trained and I could drive one. Now at UPS I had to go through a 30 day training qualification. The overwhelming majority of that was on safety and if I couldn't prove that I could be safe within 30 days and then safe within X amount of time period after that, I didn't get the job. Um, so what happened in 1999 here in Europe, um, the, the categories of licenses changed and now when you get a driver's license, uh, you're, you're able to drive up to three and a half ton, uh, but most of our vehicles are seven and a half ton. So in order to get a seven and a half ton, and it, and it was great, it was decided that we need training, everybody should have training, uh, and everybody should have a professional qualification. Well, the training costs, um, the, the, the training is, um, to get a C1 license right now, it costs 4,000 euros. So, so the average, I'm 21, I wish. Is anybody awake? Okay. I, I, okay. So, so in, 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 at that age, I've got to come up with 4,000 euros just to get a license that allows me to drive a vehicle from three and a half ton to seven and a half mm -hmm. ton. Not, not the double rigs, not the tractor trailers, not any other, just, just a larger vehicle. Um, and then on top of that, even if I had that 4,000, I then have to go to what UPS would have done. We provide 30 days worth of the safety training, 30 days, eight hours a day, et cetera, et cetera. You can imagine how many hours that is from a training perspective. But in Europe, now you have to take a 140 hour training, professional driver training course that costs 2,000 euros. So I'm 22 years old. And in order for me to be able to say that I want to drive for one of these companies, I need to find 6,000 euros just to be eligible. Now, I, I'm sure the end goal from a legislative perspective was we need safe people on the road. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. Um, but but and, and why, why that's important is this. In 2008, 100 and t in, in, in Germany alone, in 2008, 110,000 people had, a C, had a C1, applied for a C1 license. In 2012, it's down to 70,000. So as we continue, and people just realize, I just don't have that. Um, it, it not only provides, now companies like UPS, in the different apprenticeship programs, we bring people in, provide them training, uh, afford them an opportunity to drive, and then help supplement to get their qualifications and, and those other types of things. But it's tough to attract people when already they don't know that those programs are aware or that some employers will do that for them. So it's tough to even get people through the door. So it's an example where goodness was meant uh, and, and it, was, it was a terrific thought, but, but it may be helping to contribute to some of the shortages that we see. What's the way out? Uh, the way out, you know, one of the things that I see is, I, I, I think, um, I'll give you an example, at, in, in the United States, and I'm looking to bring that here uh, to Europe, I'd love to work with uh, the, the different um, government agencies. In the U.S., we've got a, a school, uh, for lack of a better term, it's called Integrad. And what we do at the school is, it's complete simulation of every, every driving, everything that you can do, whereas when I took the training, you know, I was already hired, I was on the road. 
This is now a plot of land where it's even more secured and more and, and safe and away from the public. And, and we train people for that full 30 days, but they're in full-time simulation, everything from actual driving to, to technology-based, because we know people today like to push buttons and pretend they're driving and do different things. So we've tried to adapt it there. We've been very successful with it. We take our new drivers, we put them through these trainings. Uh, and then we also, you know, folks who maybe have had an accident or two that need a little refresher, we put them back through there. Um, and I think we're trying to bring that concept to Europe, and we've picked a couple different countries that we see that, that might benefit, where we can put some of these schools up. And I think it would be very beneficial if we worked with some of the members uh, within the EU um, with, with specific focus on transportation or workforce uh, engagement and training and be able to show them, okay, this is what we do. Um, how does this stack up against what costs 4,000 euros for, some, for you know, someone from the public? Uh, and then be able to say that, would this be an equivalent, almost like a, an equivalent university degree or something like that? So I think that's one of the opportunities that we're looking to pursue. Uh, but again, that's, that's, you know, while I'd like to think the world does revolve around UPS, that's really just one company, but, and the rest of the industry is struggling with those same conditions. And I assume, uh, of course, uh, uh, in, in the um, industry around trains, uh, you want highly skilled uh, people uh, for for my sake, uh, as somebody, uh, a person who, who uses trains, uh, so that safety comes first. Um, uh, how do you bridge, um, apart from with the MBA program, uh, how, uh, with the MA program, how do you bridge the gap? Well, we need them all. We need the skills, all of them. We need more capabilities. And as we've already said, the Eisenbahnindustry is a very complex industry. Es geht um Züge, es geht um Bahnhöfe, es geht um die Wartung und Instandsetzung der Infrastruktur. There's a lot of, uh, of skills and uh, we can say that approximately uh, 90 job profiles can be identified in total. Uh, traditionally, there has been a technical background, all right? Uh, and this has changed progressively. We still need technical background because there is a lot of technology in there. Uh, but uh, we have come now to uh, area much more service oriented and the, the, the main focus now is the customer and therefore gradually we have uh, uh, mixed a little bit the technical background uh, initially with a business background commercial skills and this is what we have to go forward a little further and uh, what we would need now keeping of course a, a necessary uh, technical uh, uh, volume of uh, skilled uh, personnel, uh, also commercial accounting, uh, finance, but it's also uh, uh, on the service industry, the service to the people, the service to the customers, because a lot of automation actually is replacing the uh, technical needs uh, by to keep the, the jobs at the service of the customers by a service orientation. And if I may say, uh, if there is a new technology revolution to, uh, to, 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 to boost a little bit the rail industry, it will come, and I think it was one of the theme of this uh, ITF conference during these two days, is the uh, IT industry, IT integration. Mm. And therefore, I think that this is actually a domain where uh, we are most in need of uh, skilled and motivated young people. Daniel, with, with you, I would already sort of like to start uh, the round on, on gender, and, and um, uh, then, ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's you who need to come in. Um, you shared with us uh, earlier that, for example, in the towers worldwide, there is an almost balance between uh, men and women. So what, what are you doing right there that doesn't filter down to uh, the other jobs uh, in the aviation industry? Effectivement. <laughs> yes, you're right. Yes, in the previous discussions, yes, I can tell you that when it comes to um, aviation controllers, we attract women more easily than to other professions. That's right. And personally, I do believe that this is due to the working hours, the working times, because working times for um, aviation controllers are working times that would allow for women to uh, reconcile uh, the different parts of their lives. They don't need to travel a lot. They've got a lo local workplace, so they don't need to travel. And maybe we should add 
that women have an advantage when it comes to communicating on radio because the frequency um, range of the female voice can be better transmitted in radio communication systems. So um, women are more easily heard and they're more easily understood and this is an advantage in communication and for the rest of the professions and different jobs I believe that you find the problem that exists in all of the other professions too that have um, technology on their basis and culturally speaking women are often less attracted by technology professions and by other jobs and but as we need more jobs in technology i believe personally well i don't have any studies to prove this but we have a program at the um ICAO to attract more women to these jobs, to some initial um, job training programs. But personally, I believe that there is a general trend all over the world to make sure that women would be recruited in the technology field. Because in all these jobs, you get the impression that this is something that is not culturally accepted. But finally, women that um, enter these job markets uh, are very very successful so slowly and gradually that is, is going to penetrate the job market and um, people will have greater awareness that they can be successful here as women but still there is this obstacle i.e. that in the transportation sector for pilots we still have a long way to go but here i believe women uh, would rather stay close to their families because most often it's still women who take care of the family and look after their children. Thank you very much for sharing that. Now, I heard a number of issues um, here, um, um, some of which sort of reinforced something I had already le read, but, but I would like to add a couple of things. So um, here we have uh, the very specific demand for more um, female qualifications in the so-called MINT area, mathematics, uh, information, natural science and technology. Um, so that is a question probably of schooling and um, uh, also of attitudes. Uh, but talking about attitudes, um, there is hardly any industry which still today um, is sort of fraught with the um, prejudice women don't have anything to do here. And I'm not talking about uh, the old sailors saying, you know, women on board are um, a bad sign. Uh, but but it, it is still that, that um, this is one area uh, where there's a lot of prejudice prevalent, according to studies of the ILO, uh, of your organizations. Um, so there seem to be um, a kind of, um, a, a lot of barriers ranging from technical to attitudinal. Um, so what would you say can be done if we are looking at the need for more people, for more qualified people in transportation area, get more women in, how? And, and thank you. Sorry. <laughs> and I would add one more component to the question that you raised, and that's women in leadership positions um, ac across um, transportation. Um, you know, Cindy mentioned that uh, the managers at UPS, 40% are women, and I'm pleased to say that at Department of Transportation, Secretary Fox, 40% of our senior leadership are women. You know, President Obama has made a huge commitment to the Council of Women and Girls. But across transportation, we, we you know, in many of the areas, we don't see women in the C-suites. Um, and it's, we've held roundtables on that at the Department of Transportation. Uh, we, we partner with the Women Transportation Seminar uh, to provide education for, uh, allow educational access to young girls in, um, you know, going through school. And one area that I, I'd like to mention what we've been doing internationally and it's something that we've been working on with Canada and actually UPS has been a great participant in this effort uh, as well is taking a look at women in transportation in the APEC uh, region and uh, when the US hosted the uh, transportation ministerial in 2011 we launched the program and the APEC uh, ministers uh, jumped on it and I bet you if you take a look at the APEC countries uh, Minister Raitt is probably the only female minister 
transportation minister uh, at this point. So, you know, there, there is, is work to be done uh, there as well. And what we've done is we've pursued this initiative. Instead of just looking at it as a gender diversity issue, we took a look at it from the business perspective. And the statistics and a lot of the studies have shown that companies that hire more women and have more women in leadership roles, have more women on their boards, do better. And you know, what company isn't interested in their bottom lines? Mm -hmm. And so in, in doing that, we've been able to engage um, the interest. We've held a number of forums on our Department of Transportation website. We've launched a Women in Transportation uh, YouTube video series, and uh, UPS was, uh, I believe, one of the first who, uh, who sent us their, uh, their um, video. Um, and I'd be happy to provide anybody the link uh, to that. But we have, within APEC, uh, with the help of our Canadian colleagues, we just launched a uh, women trans, uh, task force, um, and which is going to be huge. We had a women in transportation forum at the last uh, ministerial where 40% uh, of the people in the audience were men. And again, having, having all the men on this, this conversation is hugely important too because who's making most of the decisions right now? It's men. So we need to change those attitudes uh, as well. And so it, it, it is so important not just to have governmental directives, those are important, granted, but it needs to come from the companies as well. It needs to be a top-down mm -hmm. uh, initiative. So um, I could go on and on, but I think <laughs> other people want to speak as well. Lisa, um, you mentioned in, in your first intervention uh, that you're looking at uh, the First Nation, uh, or people from the background, First Nation, and uh, also at women. So um, uh, where's your take on that? Like Susan, I probably could fill the entire panel on where my <laughs> head is. Um, so I'm the first female transport minister that Canada has ever had. And to your point about what do we need to do, well, more of us need to go out there and talk about this and need to be able to um, give a voice and a face to commonality of other women who are out there in the audience as well, too, that it's a good, it's a good career, you can do it, and, and you can see yourself in it. Because if you close your eyes, and I, t I said professions to you, invariably you're going to be gender specific. When you say pilot, you see a man. When you say captain, you see a man. I was a harbor master as well, too. I know you don't picture me when you say the word harbor master. <laughs> um, but, you know, that being said, it's just about making sure that the entire pool of talent is available no matter what sector we're talking about that. We have that ability to have uh, harness all of, our, all of our intelligence, regardless of what your gender is, and, and talking about it and making sure that companies, and Susan is right, it's gotta be top down. Um, and and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I may have a policy that if your board does not have a woman on it, I may not be as predisposed to have a meeting with you if you have a concern. You may end up meeting somebody else in my office, but you're not gonna get a meeting with me. So, you know what, I talk the talk and I walk the walk when it comes to stuff like that. And I'm not going to be apologetic for it either, because that's the way it is. And I want to get more women involved in transport and I want more women in leadership positions. And if I have one now, and if I don't utilize it to the best of my ability to try to move that agenda forward, then I really haven't fulfilled what I wanted to do. My constituents know exactly what I say and they understand where I am on the topic and I'm not uh, necessarily um, going to back away from the criticism that comes with it, but you just have to think about why are you criticizing something that makes ample sense that everyone should be able to do. Um, but I will tell you, in my background, I, have a, I did come from the science and technology area too. So from the beginning, I was, uh, I was streamed into science and technology and mm -hmm. very comfortable in the space in terms of, of uh, not thinking that uh, gender has anything to do with your ability to finish a job. And I will say in Canada, between two, in 2011, the number of female engineers in the age group of 25 to 34 was three times that of women engineers between 55 and 64. So things are moving, but it's way too slow. Mm -hmm. Way mm -hmm. too slow. And if we want to wait for it to happen by natural attrition, 
it's going to be a thousand years. And I think that's a, it's a literally a thousand years, and that's a study out of out of the U.S. Might so. climate change might be faster. So, <laughs> no, sorry, uh, that was you never a good remark. Yeah. Anyway, that's you know I, no. I'm happy to talk yeah. about it all the time, um, and I'm really glad that you have this on your agenda. So I commend the ITF for this. I have to refer that uh, praise uh, to the ladies in the first row, uh, but I'd like to look at the lady in the second row, Alejandra Cruz Ross, is uh, from the ILO, and uh, specifically on the uh, aspect of uh, gender, of course, uh, the ILO has always been a, a forerunner, and uh, could you just share uh, the ILO's views on that, maybe sort of specifically targeted towards uh, transportation industry? Um, our technicians just need to switch the mobile, isn't it on? <laughs> okay. uh, well, thank you very much. The discussion has been enriching, thought-provoking. Uh, thank you to the panelists. At the ILO, we take a career cycle approach to analyze the obstacles for women to have successful long-term careers in this sector. So basically, we analyze it from the attraction, selection, retention, potential interruption, re-entry, and realization. Um, I, I have heard the programs that you have mentioned, and uh, I see that mostly they focus on um, exposing women to STEM subjects, to engineering, science subjects, and also to train them, to make them go through the selection process. And I wanted to see if you have, for example, some recommendations for the retention part and the re-entry part also uh, that have proven successful or if you have uh, some recommendations, for example, related to violence that uh, goes uh, uh, a little bit connected to creating uh, uh, the work, uh, a good workforce environment. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the intervention, uh, a planned intervention, uh, nevertheless, sort of uh, fitting uh, to the topic. Um, Eduardo, I, I would just, Eduardo, I would just like sort of to, to ask you one more question and uh, then coming uh, uh, back to Cindy. And ladies and gentlemen, then it's, it's really up to you. I've been making that promise for a while, I know. Um, Looking at careers, um, when, when I got a child, um, a freelance journalist, loving reporting, um, I had to think again, because reporting means you've got to be out of the house, you've got to jump when the opposite number says, yes, I can, um, and so you, you need to look for a job uh, that has more sort of certain hours. It seems that the transport industry, which is why I became a moderator, thank you very much, but um, which, which just in the transport industry, there are certain requirements just due to the job. Can you imagine or have you and, and your team thought about how to improve, how to maybe change um, aspects, working hours, uh, in order to make it more attractive to women? What are your suggestions? Yeah, we, we have been discussing this. We have a women's committee for Up and down, 14 Russia. years. Yeah, yeah. Um, curious enough, uh, we started four years ago a young workers committee and one of their priorities is precisely the gender issue and they are very much active in discussing the stereotypes that they have been confronted with when young women started working in the transport sector uh, and they still need, feel the need of uh, having this discussion within uh, the trade unions uh, but we also have been raising this with employers and uh, we have uh, we are now doing the second stage of a successful um, uh, project with CER, the European Railway uh, Employers, uh, precisely on trying to find ways to attract more women into the railway professions, not only for administrative positions, but for technical uh, tasks and uh, uh, more um, um, di diverse activities. Uh, we have then uh, also uh, a manual on harassment and bullying in shipping uh, addressed to shipping companies in order to deal with uh, issues of violence on board and bullying and harassment, not only sexual harassment, but all types of uh, harassment. So we have been working on identifying these situations and in, in, especially raising awareness to, to find the solutions. It's difficult to say that all companies now should use this uh, uh, solution which will fit all, um, but uh, if, at least if it, all shipping companies will have uh, um, uh, an harassment, a person responsible for dealing with uh, harassment and bullying issues, 
then solutions will be found and addressed from the beginning. Um, and so our approach has been, as a European-based uh, organization with European employers, has been to sensitize our members, their members, and also in the ETF we have, uh, if I'm not wrong, 60% of women in our office uh, in, in Brussels, but uh, in, our man in our executive committee, the number of women is higher than in the sector, which is around 20% in the sector. We have more than 30% in the executive committee. But the only solution we had, because most of the union presidents are men, was to create uh, uh, allocated seats for women, which we have increased in the last Congress. And of course, they are, in particular, those who are always present in the executive committee meetings, uh, and which uh, we, we can feel the, the the added value of having them uh, participating in discussions and more are coming or becoming union presidents uh, which as, as was said is a slow process that we have to incentivize. Cindy you've pointed out a number of um, points uh, where UPS has already sort of uh, instigated um, um, the advancement of women as far as job level is concerned. Um, one of the issues that we didn't mention before uh, but uh, Eduardo has now mentioned is, is potential violence, potential exposure, uh, which might be more in uh, transportation or in certain jobs in transportation, certainly uh, when you're a truck driver uh, out there uh, all on your own and uh, sort of delivering parcels to uh, unknown addresses. Um, is there a special training that you give to your employees? Um, how do you handle that issue? I think yeah, a couple of things, and <clears throat> while violence wasn't something that I, I saw a lot as a, as a UPS driver, um, as a matter of fact, I would say I had quite the opposite. I had uh, lots of folks wanting to help me more than maybe they wanted to help uh, if a male driver showed up. So uh, there, there, were, there was an advantage there, I, I thought. I think um, overall, the, the, um, and in today's day and age with, uh, you know, violence, violence unfortunately happens. It happens to both. It isn't, it isn't worse that it happens to women. It's bad that it happens at all. Mm. So, so I'm, I'm, not as, I'm not as familiar uh, with those particular situations. I don't know if it's uh, um, what, you know, we try to make sure that everybody feels safe. If somebody mm. isn't safe, you know, certainly we don't, we don't put folks into situations that they, don't, that they don't feel comfortable in. But I will address one thing with reference to retention. I believe there was a question on, on um, you had talked about attract, attraction, selection, retention of, of women. I'm very, very proud of, um, of uh, it's not, it certainly isn't a process. It's now part of our culture. We've got a women's leadership development, and we call it WLD. And what we do, and, and it started off very simply, is in, in uh, just about every local area that we had uh, around the globe, we would get women together. Um, that would be either management and non-management, and we'd afford them an opportunity to just um, have an evening of discussion about whatever networking situation that they wanted to talk about for support. Um, men don't realize that oftentimes, especially in a male-dominated area, you know, even discussions about, you know, where did you buy the best grill or what was the best deal you got on purchasing a car, men stand at the end of a belt or in the locker room and they'll talk about those kinds of things. And in actuality, that's, that's kibitzing. It's, it's, it's the same thing women do, it's just on different topics. Uh, and women didn't, didn't necessarily find that they were involved in those conversations. So this uh, WLD ended up turning into to the concept of connections. We do it all around the world. Uh, we're, we're very, very active uh, here in Europe. We, we've, we've found that the three basic prongs of connections um, touch women. Business connections, networking within the organization, and then connections to the communities. Because we found that one of the things that women enjoy doing is maybe they don't go play golf or they don't do a couple of other things, but they can bring their children with them on a Saturday to a community activity to to improve a, a playground or paint um, a, a women's, a battered women's center or, mm -hmm. and, and they organize them and we, it's a, it's a grassroots local effort and we have very, very strong groups that then look to, to specifically monthly, some of them do it just about weekly, have some type of an event touching one of those three areas. Uh, as a matter of fact, if we would have an ITF or something like this closer to where, let's say in Brussels, a group of women would organize that several of them were going to go out and connect with other businesses to talk about women's issues. Uh, so we really try to focus the, the networking piece. The last piece is uh, we then make and, and we ask um, 
well, I should say I ask politely, but everybody usually acquiesces. Uh, when, I, when I tell some of the men, the more senior men, you know, you're going to, you're sponsoring, or you're the co-sponsor of this particular activity that this group is going, and I want you to bring a group of, of guys to come along, because it isn't just about women. It's about, it's about men and women feeling comfortable that, okay, this is a great place to be, and that's, that's the goal of what we're trying to do at UPS. So uh, that has been extremely successful. It's continued to help us uh, get women, because what we were finding was we would get women that would go to a certain level of, of mid-management and then drop out. Mm -hmm. uh, and these have, have helped keep them uh, to what several folks on the panel have talked about, getting to a higher level uh, within management. And we've seen our, our dropout uh, rates, our turnover rates, um, with, with great reductions uh, in the amounts of females um, because uh, we, they, it was a disproportionate amount, and that has changed just the, the whole complexion and really lent itself towards where we are now. So it's been a great opportunity for us, and if I'd, I'd be willing for any businesses that are in here, uh, welcome the opportunity to share some of the things we do, invite you to some of our programs, and, and even come to your place of business and help you set some things up. Finally, it's up to you. The gentleman uh, um, in the middle of the back, and um, anybody... Uh, and the lady um, also on the right-hand block. And there's one lady very much at the back. So I'd like to collect these three questions. Sir, you share your name with us and the organization you work for. Jens Hügel, Jens Hügel from the International Road Transport Union, IRU. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the panelists for their really good analysis and for sharing some uh, best practices and good initiatives. I think we've covered most of the crucial items today, except for one thing, and that's the role of the media. And Connie, I have a question for you. Um, what do you think? How many um, features or documentaries has the Deutsche Welle shown on women in transport in, let's say, the last 10 years? Um, I certainly haven't counted, um, but I would uh, assume less than they should have done. <laughs> this is, this is, a, is definitely a, a safe answer, but uh, yes. And I, I mean, we, we from time to time actually have features uh, on outstanding people and outstanding businesses, but I agree uh, with you, the road transport, I cannot remember. Thank you for that question. Uh, the lady over here? Um, who, the other lady already has a microphone? No? Okay. Um, at the back, at the left, please. And you have now a microphone. Hi, my name is Gina Klassen. Um, I'm from Canada. I fit quite nicely into your statistic. I'm an engineer and I'm doing my master's in city planning right now and I'm looking specifically at transportation issues. Um, I, th I wonder if there's a relationship of three three points that kind of um, create a self-accountability system. So if you have, what is the vision of your company or country? Or country? Um, what is the work that you're asking to be done? And then thirdly, what is um, the life that that allows the workers to live? And I think there's actually quite a profound connection between um, the vision of your company and the lives that that allows people to live. And um, speaking as a woman, I feel very connected to the the output of my work like what are the effects of it and so i wonder if it creates a self-accountability system where if we're not creating jobs in an industry that is worthy of being promoted then you won't have people to support it and so um, one thing that i'm very passionate about is uh, local economies and providing environments that are um, self-sustaining so that you know people don't need to travel all over the world to uh, to stimulate business and that type of thing, but how can people work within their communities so that they can um, live, work, shop, and, and play in, in one area? And so, I guess, specifically curious um, from, from Lisa's perspective, how, how Canada's vision is connecting to the lives of the people that um, it connects to. Can, can we still hear the uh, second and third question? I think okay. there was another lady uh, who was raising her arm. So yes. please, uh, it's up to you now. Thank you. Um, Heather Allen from TRL, um, a research institute in the UK. Um, I want, first of all, to, to thank the ITF also for having this, this panel, because it was a great panel and you really put forward um, some fantastic examples of what can be done and what should be done. 
I feel a little sad because I popped in from the next door uh, event. Um, and that's a room full of people, people almost standing in the back. Uh, and it's about how to it? optimize infrastructure. And the title of this ITF is Transport for a Changing World. My question is, how can we make the legacy of this ITF really help women um, both encourage them to come into the sector. I came from outside the transport sector and it's a fascinating sector for women to be involved in. And it's not just about the mint side, it's about the social side, the environmental side, the political side, the governance side. There are all sorts of things that the strengths of women and the way we think can really help move transport into the kind of transport that we need in this new world we're living in. So how can we really leave a legacy from this ITF? Thank you. Thank you so much. And the lady in front of you, did you just raise your arm in assistance? Yes, thank you. Um, so um, I had the feeling that you wanted to answer straight away because you were nodding so much. I Sorry. Knew. No, I, I have. Where I'm, is it? Oh. I'm, I'm hanging on to it now, unfortunately. Um, I was worried that the other uh, seminar was going to be oversubscribed, but when, it, when they're looking at optimizing infrastructure, we're looking at optimizing human resources in this room, and, and without human resources, you're not going to have any infrastructure that is worth having because no one's going to be running it. So I hear what you're saying, but that's another challenge that we all have. Um, you know, vision, work, and livelihood, it's, um, it's a connection that 40 years ago, how I want to live my life and does my work fit with it was a consideration that was not, not something that people had. It was, uh, you're going to have a job and probably going to have the same job for the rest of your life and you'll get a pension at the end of it and you'll raise a family and, and that's basically it. And now we are, we are faced with a new world where people want to connect with their work and feel, feel, uh, feel, um, validated and it's part of their lives and that they have a good balance in life. So if you were to ask me what our vision is for Canada, it's, it's jobs, growth and it's long-term prosperity. And the work that we ask for people to do is to help us create these jobs so that families can have an economy and then tying it in with their livelihoods is just increasing the quality of life. And that's done in a lot of ways, either by infrastructure or by having good transportation routes, public transit, all these good things that are being talked about here. Um, but Canada's just one country in a, in a big globe. And what we see in this forum, and why I like it so much, even though it's my first time here, is that there's a commonality of issues across the globe that are very similar. And ministers can come here, talk to industry, talk to people, and see that perhaps you can look at the issue from a different way and come with a solution that does work in your country that you hadn't thought about before. So that's the value of the forum, and that's what I got out of it. And, and you know, even today, talking about um, all, all these aspects of, uh, of work-life balance, it's, it's all very important. But from my perspective, what I think I hope we bring from Canada is that we have been thinking about these issues about women in transport, that we have been thinking about violence in the workplace. By the way, we have legislation in air, marine, and rail modes that says every employer has to have an anti-violence policy and has to train their employees on anti-violence as well too. So we've been progressive in that area. So those are the, that would be my, my take on, on all those things. So thank, I feel like I'm in a, I'm campaigning for something here. That, that was a question from a town <laughs> hall audience, but thank you for the question. It's really good. I think Mary still uh, wants to, to put a question, but I should think uh, Susan can put forward uh, an answer because she, Mary, you straight away after Susan, maybe? And, and I will be very brief. I will echo what Lisa just said, and I will say to you, young lady, that you should be in transportation. And so we'll hope to see you at an ITF forum or some other forum in the future. To the, the second question, what, can, what, what should we take away from the ITF? I think we've talked about a number of programs and a number of ideas on this panel. But one thing that I always do when I'm closing out or when I'm at a panel um, of this sort, I like to challenge everybody in the audience and on, on the stage as well to say, what's the one thing that you're going to do to promote women in transportation? 
um, because while you know these programs are great, it takes individuals. And I'll give you one example of what someone took away from one of our, 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 our forums, and that was an, an engineering professor at the University of Memphis. Um, years, for years before she had created a girls in engineering experience. But after coming to a, a forum that we held at the White House, she decided, you know what, I'm gonna get together a group of women in Memphis, and she created the Society of Professional Females, and they decided to come up with a scholarship program so that girls um, who couldn't afford to go on for an engineering degree could. Mm -hmm. And so I was fortunate enough to keynote their first uh, scholarship um, gala, but so there are things that we can all do individually, and if we all t take that pledge, then we will continue to move the needle forward. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much. Um, Mary Cross from the International Transport Forum. Um, first of all, I'd just like to thank um, the panelists and, and everyone in the room for the excellent questions uh, that have been brought forward. I, f I feel compelled to, uh, sorry, I feel compelled to um, respond just very briefly. Um, first of all, to you, Minister, to say that actually the genesis of this discussion on gender was in your own good services, um, in uh, the persons of Arlene Turner and Jennifer Little, uh, who at our management board meeting uh, back last fall called attention to the essential uh, nature of this question on gender in particular as an element of the overall workforce question. So that was uh, attributed to your, to your staff. And we took it forward, and it was a country-led approach. So that's actually how that happened. Second thing I'd like to say is, to, the, to Heather in the back, um, what can the ITF do to pursue this dialogue on human resource and optimizing human resources, you said, Minister? Um, what I'd like to say is that, based on the very inspirational uh, dialogue and exchange that has taken place today, I will take this to, um, to certainly uh, my colleagues in the ITF staff and to the Secretary General, and back to our countries, I think, to say that there is an interest in the ITF perhaps having an ongoing kind of exchange on this question of optimizing the human resource element, along with optimizing and better use of infrastructure and everything else. So we'll take that forward and put it back to our countries. Could I um, say to you, Cindy, that um, your offer to perhaps bring your model for women leadership development, et cetera, uh, into the dialogue, um, I think we would be very interested in um, helping you to, well, helping provide platform for that. And uh, we're not in Brussels, but we're not that far away either. Well, <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. So I just wanted to address those particular elements. And uh, thank you all very much for your commitment to this dis discussion today, to you, Connie. That sounded almost like the last word. Um, I, I have, however, said to everybody that we do a last round, but the last round will be with one. Um, uh, sort of uh, negative aspect, no longer than one minute, because uh, we don't want to keep people too long. So, um, uh, Jean-Pierre, um, maybe um, in one minute, your vision in five years' time, job-wise, job -wise. railways. Well, listening to this question and answers, I think that the most important question is probably not the orientation of employment by gender, but the creation of jobs. And I think that in the five years' time, transportation is mobility. Mobility is development of the economy and is growth of GDP. Therefore, this is the possibility to create jobs in the transportation sector. And there is such a shift in the diversity of jobs in this transportation mm -hmm. sector with a customer focus, with a business orientation much more than ever before, which was more technologically oriented, that I think there is probably much more space for women to take their share. Thank you very much, Daniel. In five years' time, especially in aviation. Dans, in five years, personnel in aviation, as I told you. And uh, just to be very short, we will like personnel, whatever the gender. And of course, if we have more female uh, personnel coming to aviation, it will. Uh, maybe solve the problem. If, if we had the same proportion as men attracted to, to this domain, maybe we'll solve the problem. 
Thank you so much. Eduardo, in five years' time. Before the 2008 crisis started, there were figures pointing to um, more than 100% growth in aviation by 2020. Uh, and in all transport modes, growth was two digits, higher than 20%, with inland waterways being the lowest one. Um, some figures say that we are now, in some levels of the industry, back to 2008 levels. So we are expecting the growth. We are foreseeing the lack of uh, skilled st uh, personnel. It's time to invest now. It's late to invest now to, to fit all our uh, needs, but it's necessary that this is done with uh, respect. As people said yesterday, Professor Galbraith very, was very clear, in full respect, in compliance with international standards. Transport professions are, most of them, highly regulated. And if we keep to, to the um, uh, social and labor standards, people will feel attracted um, with incentives from governments. We need that in, instead of paying unemployment subsidies to students, that they pay their licenses, that they pay their training, and they put them working, paying their taxes to recover that, that money. It pays to invest in this. Cindy, in five years' time. In five years' time, I, I, I'm going to bring up one, one other topic. I'm going to go off, off your question, and it's, and it's only this. One of the things that we do see on people having abilities to do more uh, is the fact here for anybody from the ITF's perspective, we could get some assistance on, on, on simplifying the ability to create mobility, flexibility in the workforce. Mm -hmm. uh, we have plenty of women. We also have plenty of men who would take other opportunities, have opportunities to grow up. But unlike in the U.S., uh, here you don't necessarily automatically get a work permit for your spouse or your partner or significant other to move with you to be able to have opportunity in the other country of choice. And I think that's a very big issue when we start to talk about uh, uh, upward opportunity, people with, um, with greater capabilities to do more. So it's just one last pitch for anybody who has EU ties here. Thanks. I'll uh, go on with Susan and then Lisa in five years' time, Susan. In, in five years' time, we will have programs in place that will make a, uh, transportation and to really showcase the importance and why transportation is a great opportunity. We will f uh, have better uh, workplace flexibility for our workers, and we will have more women in the C-suites. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. uh, five years from now, we will be able to take the weird statistic of youth unemployment and match it to the vacant jobs we have and somehow figure out how the two work together. Um, and that we take a little bit of that anxiousness that we feel as a society about jobs, whether or not you have one, if you're gonna keep it, how good it is. Because right now, a politician's life is all about and measured in one currency, and that is how many jobs, what's the unemployment rate, that's what people care about. And I hope the edge is off a little bit in five years. And a lot of these jobs can be in transport if we just make it attractive enough. Thank you so much. In five years' time, ladies and gentlemen, will be 2019. Uh, we'll have another ITF. Maybe, did I say that wrong? Yeah, no. Okay. <laughs> um, my, my mathematics with small numbers is always okay. Um, and there's one wish I would have, that we would see uh, people from India, China, Africa a bit more than we have at the moment. We have uh, some Asian uh, colleagues, but when I look at your membership, um, there's Spend the Globe. Uh, we have uh, up here on the panel, finally, sort of gender balance. Um, the next step is uh, to get more diversity in uh, by different uh, nations. So thank you very much. Uh, there's always something else to sort of put onto it. Um, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your patience and for your willingness to discuss and also to wait uh, a bit longer than I originally wanted to bring you in. Thank you.